in terms of timing, this is really not quite true because what actually happened was we went to New York first and then we went to Philadelphia and and then we went to Washington and the final place really was Baltimore. But yeah. in terms of, 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 of the sorting everything out, it seems more sensible to put the Philadelphia and the Baltimore together. Which, which in fact we did. Now the first, the first picture shows me. I, I, I'm still terribly depressed when I look at this. I wonder who this little old lady is because I've got this weird mental picture of me with sort of reddish brown hair and all that. And this funny lady is me. But there we are arriving in. in is this arriving in in Philadelphia? I suppose. No, this is us leaving but New York. This is and, us leaving. And the reason, I mean, I, it's my fault because I took a, a terrible photograph. I should have um, <laughs> sort of photographed Pat better. But here she is with her iPad, um, and she actually followed. It was it was amazing, like this kind of confluence of technology and generation. Because I put. Google, I put like uh, Apple Maps or Google Maps on her iPad and she was actually able to follow our route from New York all the way to Philadelphia on the map with like an aerial view, which was amazing. It was lovely because see it, see it And all. you were able to see like, you were able to kind of cross-reference it with, with the previous yeah. trips that you've taken. But this is to scale. So I hired a car for us and then took us down. And this is just the back end, two thirds of the car. So you can see her for scale with the size of this basically monster truck that we basically took down. <laughs> Mind you, all of our various suitcases or whatever are in the back. So that was probably what was so big. Anyway, this and this is looking out of the window at Philadelphia. It doesn't look particularly beautiful and it wasn't. I mean, but it the, the town itself we thought we, we we quite liked, didn't we? In the end, but you have. I mean, in terms yeah. of the reason why I took this is because also the little the, these are like little old style. So this is in the very old old town, like center of Philadelphia, and then you have almost like social housing, which looks a lot like our social housing here set up. But there's this kind of like yeah weird sort of mishmash. It is a weird mishmash of people. Anyway. Now, first of all, we went to the Barnes Collection. Now, this, without question, is the most extraordinary thing. Now, this particular photograph comes from the, the original place for it. Now, when, when Dr. Barnes started the Barnes Foundation in 1922, he lived in, I suppose, if, if we sort of think of Enfield, it was like Enfield is to the West End. It was in, it's in the suburbs of, of, of Philadelphia. And it's a place called Merion. And it was a big, big country house. And he always had intended it to be like a, a teaching foundation. He had the weirdest way of teaching. But he actually hung the paintings that he'd bought all this time himself. And when, when he died, he, he, when he insisted that the, his, his, his particular hang of the painting should never be changed. So eventually they sold this place in Marianne and they brought it to Parkway, which is the center of uh, Philadelphia. And they put a sort of a, 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 exactly as the interior of the Marianne pic place had been. Now I, I've been, this is the second or third time I've been to the Barnes Foundation. So I had originally seen it in, the, in its original place. Now, what is interesting, as you see, he, 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 he's very, very proud, and it is extraordinary, his collection. If I tell you, and I still really find this almost impossible to believe, he had 64, I think it was 64 Cezannes. I've got it written down here somewhere. And it was something like 64 Cezannes and, and, and uh, 182 Renoirs and 59 Matisses. This is in one collection. Mm -hmm. He started to collect Suzanne very early. There was a man called William Glackens, who was an, a, an American painter. And uh, he, uh, Dr. Barnes, made his money out of something called Argerol, which I gather was a sort of something, it was a sort of a, a, a for the eye of something, for the, a, an ointment for the eye or something. But he made a fortune on this thing. And this is where he got his money from. And in, he'd been to uh, 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 Europe 
in the 1890s. He'd seen the painting, he decided he wanted to do this, and he wanted to, to, to actually himself uh, determine uh, what people should look at. And so finally, he started to buy the stuff. He bought it incredibly early. He bought his first Suzanne, for example, in 1912. This William Glackens man and he, Glackens was a sort of uh, an American artist. They'd met in, in, a, in, a, in an art school. And he, in the end, he'd seen the pictures that he wanted to buy. I mean, the uh, 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 part Barnes had. And he sent Glackens over to Europe. And Glackens, it was, who actually purchased these pictures. And this is when he purchased, for example, that incredible Suzanne and the Sura at the top. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see the sort of things that it, this is the way he hung it. And all these very strange pieces of metal were also uh, part of his collection. This yellow wall and, and a lot of African, um, African masks. He was one of the, in terms of America, he was one of the earliest collectors to buy African art. He was an extraordinary man. He was born actually... Uh, he, he was born in uh, in 1872. He died in a in a in a car accident in 1951. And he and his this lady who was, whether she was his mistress or I don't know, she was called Violet Di Mazzo. And they had this series of 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 uh, of, of, of uh, the art. Uh, he 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 taught. He and she taught a particular kind of of, uh, of art. Now, when uh, Bill was actually in Philadelphia at the same time, but he wouldn't go anywhere near it because if you went anywhere near it, all you ever had was, as I said, as I've already said, how many uh, Renoirs were they were, and you were literally rammed into a Renoir all the time. He he. He says he liked Suzanne for his geometry, but he liked Renoir for the for the sensuous quality. And certainly, your we didn't we weren't so wild about Renoir, so we didn't take very many. Okay, well let's put the next one on. You'll see the the pictures more generally, and they are absolutely extraordinary. The uh, the, the three model the, the the models were painted in eighteen eighty six, and at the back of it you can see you know the the the, the uh, the park one, the, the important one, posing in front of the Sunday and the Grand Chat. And you can see that. That was 1886 to 1888. And on the other one, it's this great Suzanne. Now, this is, Suzanne did about five of these people sitting, playing uh, playing cards and so on. But this is a, actually one of the biggest. And it was painted in 1890 and, and or 92. And as I say, there were five versions, but this is without doubt. He bought this late, actually. He bought he bought the uh, he bought a Suzanne earlier, but this one he didn't buy until 1925. Okay, let's have the next one. And here are some of the most astonishing Suzanne. It really th these these were amazing. I don't think I've ever seen such a sort of sensitive portrait, Suzanne. You know, he painted his wife dozens and dozens of times. But this rather bad-tempered looking lady, at least it looks absolutely direct. And this is her. She was all Thomas Fique, and she was born in 1850. She died in late, she died in 1922. And she and her son, uh, when when Suzanne when Suzanne had his first major exhibition after his death in in in, in, in 1907. And at first it didn't make all that. And by 1912, you could still buy them relatively cheaply. But then suddenly everybody wanted a Suzanne and she and her, and her son did incredibly well out of, out of this thing. The middle one is, is a peasant standing with his arms crossed. And I think that is extraordinary because somehow or other, he's given the pe peasant enormous dignity but my very great favourite is the boy in the red vest. He did this about, there are four versions of it, but this I think is the most beautiful one. Now, this little boy was in fact an Italian model and he was about 14 years old when he did this painting. And, and there, is no, there is no doubt about it that, 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 that this, this man in the centre he was actually, he was one of the, the uh, Suzanne's employers. 
employees, and he sat for the card players. So he's the same man as, as we saw a little while ago in the card players. Okay, let's, let's do, because this is a very important one. This, Suzanne, is incredibly important because uh, this is the Gardon, and this is a hor the horizontal view, but the important thing is the effect it had on Brach so much later. Now, eventually, Brach is going to do a version of this, but about in, 19, in, 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 in something like 1908, 1909. But this particular one, it's, 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 it's in a mountain village, and it's in between Aix and, and uh, Marseille, and he, he, Suzanne liked the villages. He, on the whole, personally, when he when he went to move, he 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 liked living in villages. Now the skull one, it's a memento mori, and it's a reference to the the the, the sickness of his mother, who died pretty well soon after it. It's eighteen ninety ninety two, and it literally has got this sort of personal distress but look at the at the composition because this kind of flat composition is and this horizontal composition is what is going to be so important this is what a, a Barnes admires about about uh, Suzanne most especially and if you look at the next one it's the most important the most important early bather he owns that and this is this one bathers at rest and it's 1876 and 77. Now, if you remember last week, we saw that wonderful nude male bather. And this is the first time we see this particular pose. And it's in this one here. This is very, very much earlier. Now, this particular picture really is, a, is, is not, I mean, the, the people did not pose for it. It's really kind of a memory. He and Emil Zola were very, very great friends when they were children and young people. Emil Zola's father was, a, was an engineer and he, 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 he went down to, to, to make the fires up there. And the two boys were, used to go into the woods together and they used to go bathing. And so this particular picture is basically a memory and the kind of people, the kind of, as I say, they, 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 they were, it was not del deliberately posed. I mean, th these figures probably came from from sculpture and all sorts of things. But this particular picture is enormously important. And uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's, as I say, it's 1876 and and, uh, and, seven, and seven. Now again, um, bought much later, this particular picture was not bought until 1932. He mostly bought from Vollard. And the group of Vegas on the right is much later. And, Compare the two. Uh, this is 1892-94. And you know, the, eventually we're going to see in, in, in Philadelphia Museum, we're going to see the greatest of the large bathers. But here you get this whole sense, this one, you get the sense of where his 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 sort of the landscape and the bathers themselves seem to be part of the same thing. Mm. There, there, there is is kind of a a mem not a memory, but a sort of a, a fantasy of what it was like. Okay, next one. Now, this is a very strange one. This is Soutine. And isn't this extraordinary? Soutine, actually, he bought this, actually, he bought this in 1923. And, and it, Soutine himself was born in 19, uh, 1893, died in 1943. And he was Russian, but he spent most of his life in, in Paris. And these were painted in Paris. But this this particular one is a self-portrait. No, this particular, sorry, is this is a oh, believe it, I thought it was a self-portrait, but in fact it's a woman. I think you would have difficulty. I if it was only the title that said this, it called Woman with Round Eyes. And I really genuinely thought it was a self-portrait. And this is 1919. The one on the right is a flayed rabbit which is extraordinary. When you think of the blood of when you're actually cutting a rabbit up, it seems to, it seems you almost touch this thing. It's very it is bacon quite, earth. Very, it is bacon, you're right, dear. And, and he, he was, he, 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 uh, 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 he um, uh, the, 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 basically German expressionism, it, but it shows you the variety of, of uh, Barnes's collections. Okay, next one. 
because this is a surprise. These are Van Goghs. Now, I honestly would never have believed that the one on the right was Van, Van Gogh, but it is. It was painted early. It was painted when Van Gogh first came to Paris from, from Holland, and he was in Paris when he painted this, and it's at the factory, and it's a glass factory, and all of these things on the right are glass balls. But look at the way he paints the, 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 the look at his brushwork. It's tremendously interesting. Look at look at the top here, and you'll realize that he's met Signac, and there's a just the beginning, almost the beginning of a kind of point in this time for, to cut with this with this painting at the top here. Now the one on the left, I think, was even more. That's that's later. This was painted in eighty eight, when of course he'd gone to the south of France. And this was painted in, in, in San Remy that particular time before, just before he went to San Remy into the hospital. It's an unusual, but they're both unusual Van Goghs, I think. And uh, uh, but but the the industrial one is very interesting. Uh, as I say, this one was was painted in art. Okay, next two. Now this, I think, you'll not be surprised. This is Manet. These particularly clear colors. I don't think anybody else had this kind of this question of light. I think those those sheets hanging on the line are quite remarkable. It's called the laundry, and it's eighteen seventy five. And look at the little child, and the way that the, the grass is, the, the plants are kept are painted, and the extraordinary water as she's wringing out the the cloth. You see the water coming down here. And the whole thing has got such a, a miraculous kind of unity to it. The other one that was painted that was painted in seventy five, and the other one was a bit earlier. This was painted in Boulogne. Do you remember the time when he was when he was spending his summer time in Boulogne? And it's called Tarring the Boat, and it was it was painted in seventy three, and it's you know it's in, it's on the channel on the northern channel. You know, that is, this is Normandy. And these, I think, are absolutely splendid. Uh, this, he, he put it in for the salon, but it was rejected. And uh, uh, of course, he never, he, never, he never was lucky enough to get it. Was, and of course, he never really showed with the impressionist. OK, next one. Now, this, I think, is very funny because it's Courbet at his, at his most extraordinary rudeness. Isn't it funny? But you see, you have to remember how the younger generation, how much they admired Courbet, because you have to remember that Courbet himself was an extreme Republican. And he he was, at, when, there, when, when there was a takeover by the Crown again in the, 18, in the early 1860s, he very, very firmly was part of the, the Republican group who, who, who defeated this. And and he, there's no doubt about it in terms of, of realism. He's virtually the first important realist. This is paint, painted in 1864. It's got a sort of strange. It's called Woman with White Stockings. She's only got one white stocking on, and of course, what we all look at is not really the white stocking. But I think it's very interesting because the effect that Courbet had on Suzanne because that very strange picture on the right is Suzanne, and it's later in the Swan, of course. It's about about 1850, or perhaps a little bit later. They don't really know the date, but they do now, they've now done some, their homework, and it was very controversial for years, and they found that it was actually painted probably from a poster, a poster selling perfume or something. It certainly was not painted from a real a real figure, and it was as as I said probably inspired by a photograph. It was painted around about eighteen eighty, um, or eighteen eighty or eighteen eighty seven. Now the next one we're going to see is very 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 important. This is Bonheur de Vivre. Now this picture nineteen o five nineteen six is one of the most important Matisses he ever painted. Now, briefly, it was like this. It was so shocking. To us, we can't understand. 
we're so used to these colors we don't we were not shocked but when this was shown in the sun on the ton there was hysteria it was screamed at people laughing and screaming and so on matisse himself was very very poor at the time and he and his children and his wife have went were, were actually in a small place called colore where this is painted and this was just on the edge of France and Spain, just a bit by this. Never, never uh, seen by, it wasn't a, It wasn't at all a tourist place. The only people that were there were the sort of the local fishermen and so on. And he and his wife spent most of their summer holidays with it. Now, this particular picture is 1905, 1906. And it was actually shown in the Salon de Tom in 1906. Now, from this particular picture, Duran joined him the next summer, or well, summer after it. And this is when we're looking at the beginning of Fauvism. Now, this picture was so, so innovative. Now, it's a kind of, it is a total fantasy, but it's about love and it's about love and happiness. Every one of these creatures in this picture, all the images in it, are people enjoying themselves and having the most beautiful time in this wonderful landscape. But most important, you see the sense of the dancers. Now, this particular group of dancers are going to be all the way through Matisse's life, and they're going to come right out at the end in terms of the cutouts. It is said, he wrote later on, that what inspired him, these these fishermen, when they when they had a decent haul, every morning everybody in the town, went, although it was a little tiny village, went to the went down to the to the to the beach to to see what sort of fish they came in. Now, quite if it was a very very good time and they they had a bit to drink, the fishermen themselves would do this sort of dance, and so basically. The dance really was inspired by this very primitive dance that the fishermen would play. I didn't know this until I read this quite recently, but look at the details of it. It's absolutely beautiful. And the it was completely, when it was shown, people were roaring with laughter. They thought, they, they thought he was a madman. They screamed that he was a madman and they paid no attention. This is probably the most important beginning of Matisse's uh, important career and there's me sitting looking at it and it's that, a, it's a, you, what, from what you're saying it's like an example of, of a piece of art or, or creative oh, output completely. that shifts the movement oh completely it was the beginning of it was it absolutely it changed it changed for the first time there's no um, uh, three-dimensional drawing there's very little no interest in single eye perspective the whole thing is incredibly flat it looks like a sort of, in a, in a, it, it, it is completely the beginning of modernism is what you're looking at, really. Mm -hmm. It's a very important picture, this one. And to have this, for them to have it, he actually got it, strangely enough, he got it from Steins. He, it was bought, after all the screaming and laughing, it was bought by Leo Stein for virtually nothing. The, the, the Matisse was very, very poor. But after this, he, his, his reputation, although he was derided, his reputation became quite quick. And eventually, uh, the Stein stopped buying him because he got too expensive. OK, next one. Look at this. Isn't this absolutely wonderful? Now, this is a very important picture. This is Madame Matisse. But look at the way it's painted. Now, this tells us an enormous amount about Matisse. Matisse was born in a hideous part of France, which is sort of right on the edge of the channel, really, northern France, a place called Catou. But this particular place was traditionally, from years and hundreds and hundreds of years, it was a, it was a, a, a place where people made, made fa wove fabric, particularly silk, silk fabric. And for the whole of his life, he, he was passionately interested in fabric. Particularly, particularly the fabric of the Middle East. Even when he had absolutely no money, he used to go to the scrape around the sort of junk shops and try and find bits of fabric 
and this is what Madame Matisse is wearing. At this time, he he'd only he went to Algiers for the first time for two weeks in something like 1906, 1907, and he didn't like it much. But he again he bought bits of bits of material, and this is what she has on her hat. And this is the red madras headdress of 1907. And this was originally, uh, 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 eventually, Leo Stein didn't sold it again to his sister-in-law, Sarah Stein. Now, Sarah Stein is hardly ever spoken about because the Stein collection was taken over by Gertrude, who was Leo's youngest sister. These two young young, relatively young Americans. They were about 25 when they first came to Paris. Their money came from the San, uh, from the San Francisco uh, sort of uh, tra trams, you know, up and down. This is where the money came from. Michael, the younger brother, was married to this lady called Sarah. And it was Sarah, according to Matisse, who had the best, uh, the, the, the most extraordinary ability to understand his work. The one on the right, for example, was in fact a Sarah Stein one. This is a seated Riffian, and this was November, December 1912. The head, red hat is 1907, because in 1912 he returned again to, to Morocco, and he spent two, sum, two, two, two summers there. And this is when his work really began to take on this marvellous sort of slightly oriental sense of colour. Okay, next one is a beautiful picture because mm. look at these, look at these. These are part of this is all part of this this passion for the Moroccan for the Moroccan ideas. I'll pop this up here. Let's put this somewhere else because I I want to read it at the end. Now this particular group, are they were the three sisters. This is nineteen seventeen. And they they're actually posed by two Italian models, not three, but they are absolutely gorgeous. And three, they're the triptych here, and you see the detail here. The the the, 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 the photographs are wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, they they really they really are extraordinary. There's some there's the sense of community is so splendid here really in this particular where these sisters are involved. Okay, and the next one is absolutely splendid. This is a very interesting one and very rare. This is the only time that Matisse ever painted his family together. Now, what we have here is this. Sitting in at the piano is Pierre. That's his second son. At this time, he's 17 years old. And Marguerite in the, is, is the elder sister. Now, Marguerite was not Amelia's daughter. She was, she was, the, she was the daughter of his, uh, an earlier mistress. But Amelia took her over as a young girl. Now, Marguerite is enormously important for Matisse because she, together with Amelia, became his, 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 his model. And he, masses of well, most of all the paintings later on when they've got females in them are either Marguerite or his wife. Now his wife is sitting out in the garden there and sitting right in the front on the left is Jean. And this particular picture has a very special connection because it was the First World War. And Jean was just coming up for 18. And the minute he was 18, he was of course gonna have to go into the army. So this picture is just before that experience. Now, what is very, very interesting and something I've only just learned is that Matisse was a very, very good violinist. In fact, one time he used to, sometime when he was very, very broke, he often used to play violin for money. And on the front, he's in the picture as well because his violin is here. So we've got the whole of the family. This is the only one that he ever did. And it's called the music lesson. And the, the figure in the, up here is the music teacher. And she actually is the wife of one of his friends. So the whole thing has a tremendous humanism. Now, the one on the right is later. This particular one is 1917. The one on the right is, is 1919. And he's moved to Nice. And this is his hotel 
bedroom. And he's painted many, many, many of these. Look at the light. Look at the way he's described, because what he was terribly excited about, in fact, spent the rest of his life, basically, in Nice and that particular area. It was because of the light. Remember, he came from this northern grey town, and he thought the light of the Mediterranean was quite remarkable. And this is an extraordinary... Look at the way he's described space, because we're inside the, 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 this rather narrow hotel bedroom. But look, at look, the, 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 there's a shutter in open, and through the shutter, we can see the sea and, and outside. It's a, it's a really very beautiful one. He's got the most astonishing Matisse's, but this lot, my goodness, this is the most astonishing one. Now, this is 1930. Matisse, by this time, was, of course, in, internationally well known, and he actually visited, uh, uh, in 1930, he visited America and Ta Tahiti and America. And he went to see the barn. He went to see barns because, because, because I've already said how many, how many Matisse's, I don't know whether I did tell you how many Matisse's it was. It was extraordinary. Something like, uh, I've gotten written down. I was, I keep forgetting because there were so many of them. Uh, where was I? I, 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 there was something like sort of 39 or something like that. No, 59, has 59 Matisse's, 182 Renoirs. But this, he made this, we're, we're, we're now in the house of Merrier. Now this again, has been transferred to to, to uh, Parkway now. But here are the windows. And that, in the original one, there are paintings, you can just see the top of it. But this particular dance was commissioned by uh, by uh, Matisse when he went to, uh, by Barnes when he went to Matisse went to see him in 1930 and this was actually done twice because he got his 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 um he did drawings of of, of and he got his his uh, um his 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 uh, size wrong and so he had to make another one and there is one now in Paris, the first one is in Paris, in the in the, in Orsay. But this one is finally one. Now this is very very important because from this, as you can see, you can see the cutouts. And we're talking 1930, 31. Okay, next one. This is what he had to, and these I think are so interesting, particularly the one on the left. It's a very beautiful. Picasso. He had several Picassos, but this one I think is a bit. It's the blue period. It's very early. It's 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 the acrobat of the young Harlequin, and it's 1905. And it, he was living in the Bateau Lavoir at this time when he painted this one. But the one in the centre is going to surprise you. This is one of the most beautiful pictures I've seen of his. But this is Toulouse Lautrec, astonishingly. And and this this is is Lautrec was born sixty four died ninety nineteen oh one, and this particular lady was a dancer at the Moulin Rouge, and she was called Rosa à la Rose because she had red hair, and this particular one, this particular painting which he did of her because he was fond of her, was hung in. In, uh, 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 in 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 Br an Aristide Branch nightclub, and so uh, uh, that particular one was it was also in Montmartre, and she sang. She was a singer. I think it's a lovely one. Okay, next one, and here we have De Chirico, and most importantly, it's De Chirico's portrait of Alfred Barnes, and that was painted in 1926. And this particular one is called The Arrival. And this is a very interesting one because at this time, the Kiriko was inspired by, by, by the philosophy of Nietzsche. And if you look at this carefully, it's a combination of classical and modernity, the train in the background and the sort of classical um, architecture and the figure in the sense. And this was much earlier, 1912, 1913. And this one, the Barnes was 1926. Now we are, move, we are moving up now to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Of art and we're going to see, 
Now, this is, a, this is I'm going to briefly explain to you. The reason I put this on, this particular Poussin is also in the Philadelphia uh, Museum, but it's an important one. It's the birth of Venus, and it was painted in 1635 to 36. I've put it on to explain to you why all of the painters we've been looking at were doing in some version or another the bathers. They were all based on this rather classical one, of this classical th sense, because at this particular time, the only way to get into the salon was to do a sort of a classical history painting. This particular one is a very important one because Poussin was perhaps the best in terms of the best painter in terms of, of the classical composition. It's beautifully composed, this one. Look at it very carefully, because it really is very important. And this is exactly what was looking, what, what all the, uh, this particular group of picture, uh, uh, painters who wanted to be accepted, we're talking now before Impressionism and of this, uh, this, was, this was the sort of thing they were looking at, because the next one will show you this. This incredibly awful, I think we think awful picture was caused by Renoir. But this picture was taken, was painted. It took him three years to paint. It's called The Great Bather. And it's 18, 1884, 87. And it is very, very, it is again based on, on the classical idea. In this case, it's been brought up to date by the women bathing. It was meant to have, it was meant to have a sort of timeless monumental quality. But in fact, in the end, it turns out to look like a sort of a, a poster, doesn't it, really, Camilla? This one, I do think it's quite dreadful, this one. I just, but, I just, but, I just it was just, I think especially the Barnes collection. Oh. I mean, you you sort of put anybody who doesn't know Renoir, uh, have them enter the Barnes collection and then uh, move around. I think you'll be utterly vaccinated against <laughs> Renoir by the time we finish. No true. joke. There's, it's so tacky. <laughs> Okay, next one, because this shows you the greatest. This is the greatest, Cezanne. You know, he did this painting. He did this painting, this particular of the bathers. He did it three, four, three or four times. We've got one, you know, in the National Gallery. But this is the last and the greatest. Unfinished. He died in 1906. And this one was painted in 1906. Now, look at that composition. And remember the person. Look at the composition. This wonderful, wonderful sense of this, the, the, the shape of the women and the marvelously landscape in the background with the people on the back. And here's a lovely detail. It is really quite remarkable. It was very exciting to see this because you suddenly realized how, how important he was to the forthcoming young people, no, no doubt about it. It was painted between 1900 and 1906. It, 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 didn't, it didn't really have a, 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 an ex, it was never ex exhibited until 19, uh, in 19, I think it was 1926 or something. And, uh, and he actually, Barnes bought it in 1937. Okay, next one. This one, I think, is interesting. Matisse, uh, uh, Manet on the left and Monet on the right. And I think it's fun to see these two together. We're still in the Philadelphia Museum. And this particular Manet is the seascape at Boulogne. Do you remember last week? We saw all of those paintings of, of boats uh, which, which refer to the American Civil War. And this is the same time bit. And the one on the right is much, much later. This is 68, the one on the left, and the other one is 1885, so it's 20 years later. But it's the same area. It's Monet. It's the Man of Poor at Etretat. It's on the other side. We usually see this particular shape from, mm. this, from the other side. And it's interesting to see these two together because you can see the kind of... Pe Manet's blacks are always very important. And of course, the Impressionists didn't use black at all. It's one of their favorite things to discard black. And I think that, 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 that to see the two colors together was interesting. Okay, next one. 
because here is possibly, this is actually not in, it was being lent for Philadelphia and we did see it in Philadelphia, but this particular picture of Whistler's mother was bought, the only American picture that was ever bought by the Orsay. This was bought by the Orsay. So this actually is in Paris usually. It's 1871. It's an enormously important picture as far as Whistler is concerned. It's the first time we see this representation of this, this, this sort of modulation of a single tone, in this case, black and gray. And it really is quite marvelous. It's, it's always people queuing about it and because it's a picture of his mother who was called Anna McNeil Whistler. And she, it, it, he actually was born, um, uh, but he, he lived most of his life in Paris, but, but he was born in, he was, he was an American painter. And, and she, she lived for a while, for a, between 1864 and 75. She lived with him in, in Europe. And, and as I say, she's called Anna McNeil Whistler. And as I say, it's the first and only American artwork bought by the French. Okay, next one. Because this is what he was painting at the same time. And this is the sort of thing I was talking about when he's taking one color and making it and moving it into all sorts of things. This is the Thames, believe it or not. And this is Nocturne in gray and silver. And this was painted in... Um, his mother was painted 71, and this was later, this is 73. He actually died in 1903. But he 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 had a he had a sort of a, a mixture of reputation, really. Okay, next one. It wasn't all that. But this I think is terribly interesting because what we're going to see next term, we're going to see a big sergeant, and this particular picture. These pictures are Sargent in Paris. Now, Sargent was born actually in Florence, but he spent most of his life in Paris. He was born in 56 and he died in 18, 1925. And these are when he was in, the one on the left is when he first came to Paris and began to paint in Paris. And this is the Luxembourg Gardens in 1879. And he lived in the Latin Quarter. He lived with all the 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 artist here, and uh, uh, me, uh, and this is a rather fashionable couple, as you see, walking in the in a rather fashionable way. Now, the fascinating thing is the one on the right is also Sergeant, but Sergeant much much later. This is nineteen eleven, and it's Venice. Look at the difference in the paint quality. I just think it's fascinating to see these things. He spent, as an, although he was an American, he spent most of his life in Europe, really, as so many of them did. And as the next person did too, let's look at the next one, and there she is. This is Mary Cassatt. Now she came from a very wealthy American family, and the family came over to Paris, and she, she, she joined. I mean, she, she was a painter. She actually came, went to the same school that Bill eventually did, you know, the, the academy. But she came, to, when she came to Paris, she went, she moved into the, to the, uh, the popular, I think it was Julian's gallery. And she began eventually, she met Degas, the family were wealthy, they met Degas, and she became a friend of Degas. And eventually she became part of the Impressionist group. Not to begin with, but she uh, later on she did. And this particular one is her sister, Julia. It's called Woman with a Pearl Necklace in a Loge. And it's and it's 1879. She was born in 44 and she died in 1926. She never really went back to America. Her family used to come to see her. But she lived, she had a big house and she lived all her life in, in, in France. Now the one on the right is very is very very intimate one because this is Lydia again in the park. This is woman and child and, uh, and girl driving, and this is eighty one, and this is also about the independence of woman because her sister is doing the driving. The actual man behind is just just not doing the driving, and the little girl is actually Gagar's niece, 
And so this is a very sort of uh, particularly uh, um, um, about, about female autonomy, really. She was born in Pennsylvania, as I say, but she died and lived most of her life. De Gaulle was a very, very close friend. There's a nice painting, this one. Okay, next one. Now this, of course, is a very, very great Suzanne. It's millstone, it's very late. It's the millstone in the park, in the Chateau Noir, very late. This is 18, 1894, probably 95. And he had, he, 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 he made a, a sort of a little sort of a hut in this place, up just off, uh, away from Aix in the country. And he spent his time in his place where, and this is where he did most of his late paintings. But the one on the right, I think, is a tremendous surprise. This is Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Lorraine. It's astonishingly modern. It could have been painted, I feel. Don't you think it could be like that? Well, I've always thought an well, amazingly modern painting. It's very kind of um, it, uh, quite gothy, like is, goth, like emo. It's, it's, it's very, it's, it was very late. I mean, it's 89. It's painted after he's been in San Romy. And it's up, you know, when he went, when he, set himself, he put himself into it. And this is just before he goes to Auvergne. And he, uh, he, he, he painted it when he was a patient in the asylum. But it's 1889. Okay. It, incidentally, I gather that in Paris at the minute, there's, there's the late Auvergne Van Gogh's, which are going to be finished in January. Okay, next one, but they are in Paris at the minute. This one, I, I would say, I was surprised. This, of course, is Van Gogh. You recognize this. This is, of course, what the postman's wife is with Madame, Madame Rowan. And this is Mother and Child of 1888. But I thought it was interesting to see the sunflowers because when I think our sunflowers in the National Gallery are much nicer. You remember, they've got a sort of blue. Do you remember our ones have got a sort of blue mm. line all around the edge? But this time he's put a red what line. And it doesn't, I don't think, work so very, very well. But they were both, this is 89 again. The woman, uh, Madame Roland and her child, are a little earlier. They were terribly kind to Susan and Goff. The, 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 they looked after him right up until he went into hospital. They, but it, so, they, so these are these are sort of almost family for him. This painting is almost family. Okay, next one. And this one I think is absolutely wonderful. It's to lose the trip again. But this is the Moulin Rouge, and this is eighteen eighty nine. And isn't it marvelous? Look at that girl dancing. Dancing at the bot, but he uses these people again and again and again. It has the feeling of a nightclub. It's an extraordinary picture, this one. And the other one, of course, is, is the girl. But interestingly, what well, it's an interesting picture of this one. He did a, a few, he, he did a few of the, um, there were a few of them, but this particular one, uh, it's a young dancer, age 14. And it was painted, it was a sculpture between 78 and 81. But the important thing, it's the only sculpture ever shown in his lifetime. All the others that we know of the Gar sculpture were discovered after his death, and they were actually shown after his death. But this one was in his lifetime. Okay, next one. And here we got wonderful, wonderful Gogans. He was very, um, uh, 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 bought Gauguin was tremendously excited by them. And the, these all over is in the, they're in, they're in Philadelphia, they are not in the barns. The Sacred Mountain was 18, 1892. And this was painted when he, the, on his first trip to Tahiti, uh, which he went to in 91. But he was so, dis, so disturbed and so disgusted with it because what he, what he wanted to do was to find a sort of a, 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 an exciting, different group of people. And of course, it was a French colony. When he actually got there, it was the French had put their 
It was like living in the outskirts of Paris, he said. He was terribly cross about it. He had great trouble to find people in national costume to paint. And the one on the right, of course, is in national costume. And it's called Herrera Papa. And again, it's 1892. Both of these are 1892. And the colour is so extraordinary. This can, I think this, this composition is so interesting. Mm. It's a marvellous, they are marvellous, these two. Okay, next one. Now, this is a surprise. This is Duran. This is Duran being summoned, really, by Matisse to Colore. And this is what, the beginning of Fauvism. And astonishingly, this is Duran's portrait of Matisse in Colore of 1905. And it looks, the colour is entirely now about colour. Very, very little about form. And this is the cat, this is the, pict the pictures they brought back to Paris. And this was the beginning of Fauvism. Now, the one on the right is a, is a surprise. Gauguin actually didn't die until 54. He was much younger, about 20, 10, 10, 12 years younger than Matisse. The one on the right is Picardia. And Picardia's date's about 79, and he died in, in 1953. But this is interesting because this is Dances at the Spring of 1912. Now, everybody was involved with at this particular time with the dancers because what has happened is for the first time the Russian dancers had come to Paris and the, 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 there was so much excitement. People were sort of standing to try and get in to see them. And this was inspired by the Russian, the Russian dancers at the time. Okay, next one. And here we have really the 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 uh, the the Blau writer group. This is a man called Lionel Feininger. He was born in seventy one. He died in fifty six. And this particular one is I could never pronounce this properly. Umfestadt, and it's obviously a town. It, well, it's a, a town and a church, as you can see. But of course, it's broken up like futurism. And this is absolutely uh, a, a, the Blue Rider. And on the right, you've got similar things. This is a Kandinsky, and it's improvisation. They're both 1914. Now, of course, uh, Kandinsky, although born in Moscow in 66, he died, of course, in, in Paris in 1944. He lived m m almost entirely all of his life in Paris, and but was tremendously important in, in as a person, as a as a as an important figure for the coming generation. Okay, next one. And this is a surprise. I would never have known that this was a Juan Gris. And this is a man, it's called a man in a cafe. And it's called, it's post-Cubist. He was born in 87, he died in 27 in, in France. But this particular picture is 1912. And it's still got elements of the figurative on it. I think it's an extremely interesting picture, this one. And very, very like the Leger, which is next to it. Leger is later. This is, in, this is 1912, and the Leger city is 1919. But look at the way, if you look at the Leger very carefully, and you begin to, to, to look carefully at all the images in it, there are stairs, there are the whole of the city situation. It's like, like, like a sort of New York, really, now. That's 1919, though, as I said, really. Okay, next one. Of course, of course. The reason that people go is because the importance of the Philadelphia Museum is that they have all the Duchamps. The Duchamps were given, were well, bought, bought, actually, from, from the Bethany who collected them. And here you've got the very, very earliest Duchamp. Now this Duchamp was very important because it says new descending a staircase. And this was shown in the armory show of 1913. And this is the first time the Americans saw the effects of Cubism, this particular uh, 
uh, exhibition. It was the very, very first time that modern America, that modern European pictures were, 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 were brought to America. And it's new descending a staircase, and it's 1912. The one in the, in the middle, of course, is the is is you know the found object, the replica of the found object, and this is the fountain, and it's Armut, 1917, and uh, uh, he he it, it was it was he, he there were there were there he in the end when it got fashionable there were several examples whether this was the original one or one of the examples I don't know, but the one on the on the com, com, complete right, which is a surprise. This is called Caddo, and this was Man Ray. But this is an, an iron, an iron, uh, iron, cast iron, cast iron, cast iron, 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 which everybody used, but of course he's put these, these sort of nails on the back and make it, the whole thing is to turn it into something that is totally useless. <laughs> uh, he, he born in 90 and he died in, uh, in, in 1976. And it, again, we're, we're, we're expressing the ready babes. Now, the, the next one is a shock and a surprise. This is Diego Rivera. And this he was in the 1930s. He was tremendously fashionable in America. Now, this is a painting after one of his... He painted himself, but it's after his, his mural because, he, of course, he was a muralist. And this is a rather beautiful one. It's called Sugar Cane, and it's 1931. And and uh, it, it 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 was exhibited originally in MoMA, and it was bought then for the for the Philadelphia one. But this is he was enormously uh, popular in America in the 1930s. It's a very interesting series of of of. Uh, Actually, people using the uh, 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 cutting the sugar cane and bringing it through. It's very interesting. Okay, next one. And here we have the Brancusis. Brancusi was born 76 and he died in 57. He was French Romanian, really. He was Romanian, but he lived in his entire life in Paris. Now, this particular one, the kiss. It was very, very early. This is 1916, and it's limestone. And it's really quite remarkable. Look at the composite. It's actually on, on, it's, it's on its original base, and this is a sort of, uh, a sort of truncated piece of, wood. piece of wood. It's a very, very impressive place. And the one on the right is beautiful. This is this is actually Mademoiselle Pogane, and this is 1912, and this is marble. He did several masses of these, mm. of, of like that. These are lovely. Okay, and of course here is the famous glass, the large glass. And this, if you think, see it carefully, this is the called the Bride and the Bachelor's Eve. Now he took many years to do this. It, it dates as well as 1915, 1923. And it was transported when it got the glass, it got smashed. And here you see the bracket of bread was either. Now here the bachelors are at the top. Uh, the, the bride is at the top, sorry. And the, the bachelors are top, the and bachelors the bachelors are under. Down here, and of and this course, is the chocolate grinder. Yeah, the chocolate grinder. Of course they can't, they can't, they can never meet because of the, they're separated from the top here. He actually, it really is quite impressive, and it looks marvellous in this particular room. Here's a detail, marvellous detail that Camilla's done. Look at, the de look at this extraordinary detail. I actually had never seen, never realised the difference of the colour until I saw it like this, because normally it's like this, but when you see it up close, it's much more subtle. It looked very splendid, didn't it? But the one that was so surprising is the next one. Now, this was a secret. He actually, nobody knew he was doing it. It was created in complete secret between 1946 and 1966. 
and he he died it literally it was a, it was just before he died but this is a strange thing you go into this room and you have two little holes and you look through the little hole and look, you're looking of course straight into this lady's vagina and it's called the waterfall or in the illuminated glass, whichever you like. No, luckily got a, a, a oh God. picture of it. It's a horrible thing, but there you go. The it, temperature, because uh, this is when you turn a corner. Yeah, you're from very surprised to see this it. room. Yeah, this is where you enter, and this it, this thing is like here on the side, and so you kind of approach it, and you don't know what you're. I had no idea that this was this, and, there and then. Like idiosyncratically, there's this little stool down here <laughs> that you can climb up. You have to make an effort to then see this, and it just—it's just such a put on the whole oh, thing. The whole thing, the whole thing. And it, the temperature the in thing. this whole area is several degrees colder than the rest of the room. I didn't so know that, that doesn't turn off turn you off of the whole thing. I mean, the fact that there's like a sense of foreboding as you approach <laughs> that little hole. It's so disgusting. Uh, it really is. I mean, it's talking about women as objects. Oh now, God. this is so beautiful. This is so interesting. This is Max Ernst on the left and Dorothea Tanning on the right. Mm -hmm. Now, Max Ernst had the most horrid time. He was a German, of course, and he lived in France most of his life. And when the, when the Second World War came, he was first arrested by the French of because he was German, and with the absolutely carry on by all of the artists, this is in the south of France. He was he was eventually dismissed, but when the Germans went into the south of France, the Gestapo um, arrested him again, and he luckily escaped. And this wonderful man Varian Fry managed to get him into Marseille, where Peggy Guggenheim literally saved so many lives. She brought them back to America, you know, and she did Art of this Century and married him, uh, presumably for a, for, a, for a visa, because the marriage didn't last sort of five minutes. And in 1942, he sees Dorothea Tanning. Tanning. Tanning, who was, in fact, a, 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 an illustrator. And she'd done this self-portrait of uh, this self-portrait in 1942. She was born in 1910 and she died in 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 uh, 92. He was night he was born in 91, so she was very much younger than him, and he died in 76. And they married and they spent an enormous amount of their time in in in, in America, but they eventually lived moved and lived in paris but look at this painting it is so extraordinary it's surrealism it's mm -hmm. most extraordinary look at the doors they go on and on and on and on it's a beautiful painting a self-portrait of course it's, really it's a lovely painting this one and this was but the name that it was called it was title was called birthday, birthday and it was the title was given by it by by max ernst now, this is going to be a surprise. The one on the left, believe it or not, is Jackson Pollock, and it's called Male and Female. It's a very early one, and uh, it's 1942-43, and as you know, he was born 12, he died in 56. But this one is, is before the big, the big abstract ones. It's still very, very faintly, realistically painted, and it, and it's mysterious sort of addition of letters of uh, numbers on the side there. It's a very strange picture. It's well painted, but the one on the right is a surprise. This was Jasper John's, and it's called Painting with Two Balls. You see on the bottom here, Painting with Two Balls, and here are the two little balls at the centre. And this is 1960, and this really brings you together to the next one, which is an enormous shock. This is amazing. It's called it, it it's called according to what. Doesn't make any sense at all, 
but it is quite extraordinary. It is called, also called, according to what, Divide and Conquer. And it's four years later. It's 1964, Jasper Johns. And it appears, and I couldn't ever find it, but on the left, there's a silhouette of Duchamp, they say, in the panel on the left. But here, Camilla, bless her heart, has done a sideways picture so you could see it coming away from the wall. Mm. It's a, it's a mark, this is a very... This is, a, this is lovely. This, you've done a beautiful job with that, dear. Now, this I put together because it's America then and now. What we're looking on the left is Winslow Homer. His dates were 1836, he died in 1910. Now this particular one is called Temperance Meeting and I couldn't resist it. It's a milkmaid because in it, when this was painted in 1874, there was a great hoo-ha about people getting drunk. So they, they made the, the liquor and they you you couldn't buy any liquor so this particular picture is a is a propaganda for milk because it's the milkmaid and the young man on the side being offered milk by the by, by by the milkmaid and the one on the right of course is is of course warhol but it's a very specific warhol this is jackie kennedy four times and this one is 1964, and this is 1874. This is nearly a hundred years before, and I put this on together because I thought it was more interesting than now. Okay. And now we're coming to the greatest place. Now we went to the Baltimore Museum, and we wouldn't have gone actually if we hadn't realized it was so close to Washington. And so we were able to take a, 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 and you've got a wonderful photograph of it at the end of what we actually saw. But this is marvelous photograph because here are the wonderful Cohen sisters. There's Dr. Clarabel on the left, and there's Miss Etta on the right. And these are the two. And in the center is Gertrude Stein. Now, Gertrude Stein went to John Hopkins University to, to study medicine. And this is where she met Dr. Clarabel, because Clarabel finished the thing and became, a, a, she was a child's doctor. But Miss Etta became her, became the sort of housekeeper. Now these two girls had, they were, the, they were a relatively large family. They had several brothers and the brothers took over the family business. They were wealthy, not rolling with money, but moderately wealthy. They were great, great travelers. They love traveler. And this is what you, when they see, they pick up the friendship again and they come to Florence and they meet, of course, uh, uh, Gertrude Stein in Florence and they become very, very close to her. And this particular photograph, which I think is wonderful, uh, was, was in Florence in 1903. Now, when we actually got to this, it is the most beautiful museum. When we actually got into the museum, right in the front was this gigantic, it was very big, this marvellous sculpture of Gertrude Stein. And she looks like a Buddha. It's limestone. It is quite remarkable. It's not, she, it was done in 1922-23. I've never heard of the sculptor. He's called Joe Davidson. He was born in 83, died in 52. But it is really, really quite remarkable. And it, 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 she does look really like a Buddha. It's a marvellous picture. Now, the next one will show you what you'd see when you first go into the Barnes collection. And what do you see? You see the great blue nude, and we'll see that later on. It is quite, quite remarkable. Now, the, why the Barnes collection is so important is that the two sisters saw the Matisse first in Gertrude Stein's and um, Leo Stein's uh, house, uh, flat in, in Paris. 
Steins got, as I say, Matisse got too expensive for them and they stopped buying them. But Parabell originally was the buyer and they basically bought every, almost every year they bought a Matisse and they became enormously friendly. And there are lots of letters now from both the fam, both the girl, the women, and and uh, and uh, Miss. Particularly when when Clarabel died, Miss Etta took over, and it was really Miss Etta who was the great friend of of Matisse. And if you look at this room, this picture on the right, you can see their room. By all accounts, they lived in 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 a block of flats. You know, like a like 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 our sort of flats, and it, they say there were paintings and drawings all over the place, stacked up in the bathroom on every wall. Sometimes, so then there's a photograph of of, of what their sitting room looked like at one point, and you can see the Matisses all the way around. And there's 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 a a. a, a Heavens. Gauguin? Gauguin, yes. And this beautiful one here. Okay, next one. And this is very interesting because, as I say, from this one, because of their, their, their friendship, you really can see the way Matisse changed and altered his whole life because this is a very, very early Matisse. This is 18, these are both 1899. Now, this is when he had begun to become a painter. He, he was terribly unsuccessful. They had absolutely no money and they were living in great poverty. And this is Madame Matisse in bed, bearing her their first child. And this particular one, it's called The Sick Woman. It's 1899. Look at the composition, this chair in front, this empty chair. And the, the, the whole thing is on one flat plane. And the one on the right is a little bit more like, as we would know, the later Matisse, because it's the same year. It's a still life with a compote and apple and oranges. And of course, he's looking at Suzanne. He really learned. He saw the Suzannes. He saw Suzanne when he came to Paris for the first time. And he really learned, certainly, about composition. And there's no doubt his whole life, he said, he, he, he said again and again and again. He eventually, but they had absolutely no money, but at this time you could buy Suzanne when he first got to Paris. You could buy Suzanne very cheaply. And he bought the three bathers, which I haven't shown you. But he's every, this whole life, when things got very, very bad, however poor they were, there was one terrible moment when they didn't have any money at all. And he very nearly had to sell the bathers. But thank goodness the person, the, the the dealer he was trying to sell it was Bernard Joan. They didn't want it because he asked too much money for it. And thank God, because it literally, he got some money from somewhere else because he, they were, they, he was a very, very late developer. Okay, next one. And these are the sculptures. Now he, all right from the beginning, again, looking at Suzanne, and he started to do these small sculptures. And this particular one is interesting. You remember I told you that, that Marguerite was um, was the daughter of his first mistress. And this is his mistress, Madeleine, of 1901 on the left. And it was most interesting relationship between uh, um, Marguerite and Madeleine. They, 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 Marguerite took her up. She was originally when she was born. She went. She, she, she went to the the family of 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 the of uh, Ma, uh, Marguerite went to the family of Madeleine, but all the time uh, Matisse supported her, but eventually took her into the family, his own family, and he became. She and Amelia became enormously fond of each other. And the picture on the right, the, the sculpture on the right, is is uh, is uh, the reclining nude of Aurore, and this is Madame Matisse. And this is 1907. And all his life, he did the sculptures of these two women. 
Okay, next one. But this is important because this is the blue nude. It's really, really important. It was painted in Colore where he spent the summers there. And this particular was 1907. He returned, turned, and this it was time, same time as the sculpture. And here's the detail. And he 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 worked from memory and photographs. There's no nobody posed for this. And this particular picture was enormously important for the succeeding generation. And eventually, as you see, it was in fact bought by Sarah, and eventually it became part of, eventually Clara Bell bought it from Sarah, and it became the most important piece. It was always in Clara Bell's bedroom. And the, 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 it's the most, perhaps it's one of the most sculptural of all his nudes. Okay, next one. These are marvelous. These are all, now this is that particular date, by the way, is 1907. I'm telling you this because really you can see the whole of Matisse's life with this collection. And this one is the pewter jug of 1917. Now, in 1960 to 17, he had an Italian model called Lorette. And he used to dress her in these really sort of glamorous, particularly sort of Moroccan clothes. And this is Lorette, his, his woman with the turban in 1917. And of course, it's post World, World War I. And he's living in, in Nice by this time. And uh, 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 the, 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 in, uh, the one on the left shows his interest in Manet and the kind of simplified form. Now, in 1917, Renoir had moved to Cagna, which is very, very close to Nice. And when he was, when, 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 when Matisse went, first went in 1919, in 1917, he, he actually went to see the very aged Renoir several times before he died. And so a little bit of interest in, in Renoir's colour, really, in this particular time, I think. Okay, next one. Because these were a surprise. I really didn't know these at all. And these are the same sort of area. Uh, it's the Matinal uh, Viaduct of 1918 uh, on here. And this is the eucalyptus and on the one on the right is a painter in the olive grove. And they were all done roughly at the same time. These two were 1918 and this one is 1922. And it was, he, he painted them in, the first, in his first years in Nice, in the landscape surrounding, surrounding Leith. This particular viaduct is very important because it's, it's one that was painted by, later on by Bomberg, this particular area. It's very much part of the, of the district. But I was very, very surprised at these. But these were the first years in, in these. Okay, next one. But this is moved now to Monet's land, because we're now we've now come to the channel. And you can see the British Channel. We're looking at the or the uh, we were looking at Normandy really. And here you remember is it in Etretat. Remember the painting that Monet did in Etretat? And these were very much part of it. It's called in his case, it's called the Pierced Rock, and it's 1920. But this one on the right is the large cliff with the fish of 1920. And these, as I say, this area was 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 actually not just Monet, but it had been painted by Delacroix and and uh, and, uh, and and Courbet, and this is why he went there to paint. He was he he went to really to be to, to get involved with the same color. Okay, next two. This one, do you remember the story the that one of the Cone sisters had that she visited? Oh yeah. Um, she visited Matisse while he was painting this. Oh yeah. And she was so concerned over dinner with him about the that she wanted to buy it, but she first had to have confirmation from Matisse that in fact all that. of 
the animals that were here were indeed that he, while he was painting, he would scoop up water and wet them every so often to make sure that they were alive and that they were all then <laughs> put back that. into the water afterwards. So this was over dinner that she was so concerned that none of these animals died during the production <laughs> of this painting. And that was what sort of sealed the deal for her to eventually buy it. He assured her that he did everything he could to make them survive. And you can see around the back here. Do you see here? That yeah. Way. This is here. You see? This, this. Yeah. You see that where, where she is? is here. Yeah. They, they, they were so close to each other. This is so beautiful. This is Marguerite, of course. This is Miss flat in Nice. She's looking outside. This is a young woman at the window in 1921. And Matisse, Matisse, you often see him looking through a door or a window. It's a question of the idea of space. This is so interesting. Look at the expression on the woman's face as she's looking out onto the up. And of course, the other one, he thought it was very funny because he could, he was looking at the way the women were, were looking at this because it's the festival of, the, of, of flowers of 1922. And there's, there's Marguerite with her friend sitting on the balcony, busily looking down, down here. And he was very amused by the way that the women were very interested in this. And this is Nice. This is 1921 and this is 1922. So you see we're getting now 17, 20, and we're looking now at his, 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 changing, his changing style. Okay, next one. This absolutely beautiful one is the girl reading with a vase of flowers of 1922. And again, it's, it, it's, it's Marguerite. But the one on the right is very interesting. Look at it carefully. It's a bouquet of, 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 uh, of, 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 of uh, flowers in the white book. But look at the difference between the painting of the flowers in the vase and the painting in the background which is on the wall. There's a, there's a sense of the real pet, real flowers and, the, and, the, and this sort of change between reality and imagination is something that Matisse is tremendously interested in. Look at the way he uses the stripes at the back. Always, always you get this sense of, of, of clarity and marvelous, marvelous sense of space. But the most exciting one is this one. This is the, the, incidentally, they were 22 and 23, and this one is 24. This is the interior with the flowers and the parakeet. Now this he did several times. This is his flat in Nice. And the middle room here is where he did his painting. And there are many, uh, there are many examples of this particular picture with himself looking into the mirror, which is this big mirror here. But look at this interesting space. Look at the way he's using this. We've got, there's the parakeets and the big curve down. And so you've got one sense of space, middle, and then even looking out of the window. And Camilla's done this beautiful detail of so you can actually see the way that it's painted. It is one it was one of the loveliest ones, mm. wasn't it? The colour was Quite, quite remarkable. And, and, and this is one of the fates. And these, now we're going to see his, his, um, his sense, his, his, his odalesques. And the, but the first is the interior with flowers. Uh, sorry, this is, so I've got, I've got myself, I'm going to get my date right. No, it's the anemone and the Chinese vase, again, 1922. And again, the, remember I was talking about the, uh, the the composition, and again the round flowers, the round pot, in comparison to the, the, the background here, and here the bed with the again it's in his in his niece one. Now these are the old, the standing odalisk, uh, reflected in a mirror. Now I, I I I said this to the others, and they didn't agree with me. It was not my original. I read it. And what this particular critic said, and I think it was Jack Flam, he pointed out that he was making, he thought that Matisse was making a comment of colonization. 
And the other ladies didn't agree with this because what it is, she's wearing Moroccan costume, but of course she's in a French interior and particularly the interior of his, of his flat in Nice. And, 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 and Jack Flan thinks that he's making a, um, a, a comment about colonization. But as I say, the other ladies didn't agree with it, but I'm telling you that anyway. But now this is 1923. Okay, next one. This one is beautiful. This particular one on the left, I thought was my, was my personal favorite. It's a seated odorless with the left leg bent. And this is 26. And look at the ornamental background and the checkerboard. And again, the sense, somehow or other, you get the sense of space, but it's flattened up in this marvelous way. The color of this is quite remarkable. And the one on the right is, is, the, is, is uh, again, this is the Odeless with the green sash. And this is 27. And it appears these, these, these uh, uh, Italian models became almost part of the, the family. This is a very, very, in terms of his, his painting, this is a very important one. He's going to change now. His work is going to become flatter and more monumental. And this particular picture of the woman with the yellow dress took him a great many years, a many times. It was painted during his time when he was going to, to America and to Tahiti. He started it before he went. It's dated 29 to 31. He started it, didn't finish it. Took him a long, long time. And he worked on his travels. And he was, this is when he, he we'll see in a minute, he actually met, went to see Mazetta, because by this time, Dr. Clara Blow died. And it's beginning of his late style. And eventually she bought this picture. And in terms of his, 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 his composition, it's a very important one. The one on the right is just lovely. It's the interior with the dog, and it was formerly called the Magnolia Branch. Now look at the decoration of the, of the background, particularly this this thing. Uh, this is part of his passion for particularly Oriental rugs and things tapestries. that he used all as tapestries That's and nice. things like this. But this is just wonderful. This is thirty four, and the other one. Now here he is visiting Miss Etta. And there you see at the background. Oh, that's the one there, with the fish. There it is, yeah. the fish. And there are the, the two which this we haven't the, seen. But there's the one with the fish. Of life painting. But this is so splendid at this particular picture. And when he went to see her, Clara Bell had died. And Miss Etta asked him to take, to paint, to do a drawing of Clara Bell. And he took it from lots and lots of photographs. And the picture on the extreme left is his his drawing of Dr. Clarabelle, and it's it's charcoal, and he he he. This was commissioned absolutely commissioned by Miss Etta, but then he picked the drawing of Miss Etta, which is in the centre. He gave to her, and he did something like three of them, and so. Dr. Clarabelle is 31, 34, and, and, and she, this is more or less the same time. And they literally wrote to each other all the time. He was, they were constantly in, 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 in every year they tried to buy, he tried, they tried to buy, or then Miss Etta tried to buy a, an, another Matisse. Now the next one is going to be very important. Now again, he, they only bought the important ones, and this couldn't be more important. This is called Blue Eyes, but it's Lydia Delectoskaya. Now, Lydia Delectoskaya was a, a Russian aristocrat, an emigre, and she first joined the Matisse group as a sort of a companion for Madame Matisse, but obviously, the relationship between Matisse and Lydia became too much for Madame Vermeule. 
partner after 41 years of marriage, she divorced him and she moved away. And Lydia the Lecter Skye looked after him until the day he died. She is the model for the dance of the great, great dancers in all of the cut house. But there's no proof. There's no, there's no proof no, that it was like so a sort of no, salacious or no, untoward I relationship. I don't, I don't, it was, but but he she she just couldn't bear it because mm. literally he became emotionally involved, you know, intellectually involved with Lydia. She said there is a book I've never been able to find it that he did. She did write. I don't know what happened to her. Okay, next one. Because here are one of the most beautiful paintings of her. And this is, of course, the purple robe with anemones. Blue Eyes is 35 and the anemones is 37. And the space becomes much flatter. You see, you, you think about what's going to happen to his work. And it becomes, you can see now, the, flat, the cutouts, can't you? You mm. see the big, the bow thing, the whole thing becomes flatter. Okay, next one. And this is a series of the first time he allowed people to photograph him working. And this is his great pink nude. But this took him many, many, many years. And he sent to his friend all the time. He sent her all these photographs of the drawings. And you can see the way there's another, another, uh, um, a group of them as well, but you can actually see how this painting began. It's so interesting. Look at it carefully. You see all the way through, all the way through. Look, much more the face, and then finally this. It becomes simplified and simplified and simplified. And here the flowers at the back become this shape. Next one, you'll see it, and there it is. It is absolutely marvelous. And she bought it, of course, she bought it. And it hung in forever in Caravelle's bedroom with the blue nude on the one side and the pink nude on the other. And this was a great one, a great one. And it was, the pink nude is, was started in 35 and it was finished. 30, 32, 35. It's really very beautiful. And of course, everything we know comes from this. Okay, next one. Now, interestingly, these are painted by his daughter, Marguerite. And it's the Bay of Naples, 1923. And it's the Still Life with a Bottle, 1925. And she really had, was enormously important to him because even as a little girl, she joined them when she was about four or five years old. And by the age of nine, they were, they were very, very broke. But she would, she would, uh, she was sort of became uh, almost like the maid in the house. She, she laid the table, she looked after them, she posed for him and right through her life. She married in the end uh, a, a man called Doite. And I've got here, I hope, it's like, you're gonna have, to, I'm gonna have to, Read something. Marguerite was born in in at ninety four, and she died in eighty two, as a heart attack in Nice, in France. Okay, next one. And this is a is a lovely, an interesting, very interesting Van Gogh, which is prize really, and and this is also part of the Cone collection. And it's a landscape with figures, and it was a detail of 1889. And but the works later on were going to be added by Marguerite's son. Okay, next to look at these lovely Van Gogh. This was this is part of the Cone collection, and you see them the the, the, the bottom. You see the, that that his his signature. This was paint. These these boots were painted actually when when Van Gogh was in. Is in Paris with his, with his brother, and the brown boots are 87. Very, very interesting detail there. Mm. Okay, next one. This is a surprise. This is the Gauguin player, and this is 84. These are, these are the Cone collection as well. 
but the Marie Lorenzen isn't. This was bought. This was actually uh, 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 bought by by uh, 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 Marguerite's son. And this is a group of the artists of nineteen oh eight. But why it's interesting? It's this is this is Picasso, and this is this is Picasso's first mistress, and this married her, and sitting in the center is is Apollinaire, and this is an important one simply because of it. It, it describes this particular group together. Okay, next two. These are just very nice pictures over there. And they're, 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 they're of course, the Nabe. And there's Bonnard on the left and Vuya on the right. And this is a basket of fruit 24. And the other one is interior of a gray day of 21, 23. And they actually were not part of the Cone collection. They were given by a man called uh, 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 Frederic. Okay, next one. Now, these are surprising. Again, there's Picasso on the left and Braque on the right. And this one, was the, the, these two, are, they're very small. They're very, very small, very like each other, actually. And, of course, their dates were absolutely the same. But what, but actually, the Braques are later, 29, and the one on the, the, the Picasso is 24. The one that is the great surprise is the next one. This is Max Holmes. And I've already told you how he was, you know, he just about managed to escape the Gestapo. And this picture is a reference to this because they were painted, this was painted in 1942. And here, uh, it, he, uh, it's called uh, uh, the, the, the Chimera, the Chimera's in the mountain, and these are extraordinary figures. Wait, chimeras. 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 They're very strange. Very, very strange picture, this one. Now, what was surprising, the next one we're going to see, was this very, very, it, it's, it is a Raphael, and there are very few Raphael portraits, and particularly this woman is very important because she's, she is a, uh, Camellia Montefeltro. And this particular portrait was actually bought originally by an important collect American collector, a man called Henry Wallace, and he bought it from a, from a, from the, the Marcello collection. It, it, it was real. It came from from directly from the, 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 the Raphael. From there's a real Raphael. And the one on the right is a Titian. Also came part of the Henry Walters collection. And, and, and it just is a portrait of a gentleman. And it's an incredible piece of picture. And I said it, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm wrong. This one was a Montefeltro. This one, surprisingly, was bought, was, uh, was Jacob Epstein. This was owned by Epstein. Okay, next one. Because these are the most extraordinary. Of course, this is, this is due to the holophonics. But look at the difference between the 18th century on the left. That's 17. Oh, they're both by female. This one is Julia Lamo. She's, she's, a, she's a Venetian painter. I didn't know her at all. And it's 1730. And it's sort of polite by comparison. But look at the violence of this wonderful gentleman's skin. Look at the way that she's used them. The shadow and this terrible knife, mm. and the figure of the was a maid with the head, which you'd hardly see. It looks it's, almost like a piece of the fabric. It's an extraordinary piece of work. Of course, she knew Caravaggio, but it is extraordinary. This was 18, 1820, uh, sorry, 1625. And the other one was, as I said, was eight, this is 18th century. This is 17th century, and it's a marvelous pair. Now, the final one is going to show you what it looks like. And I have to tell you, it, it's the most lovely place. This is the restaurant, and we're looking out into the sculpture garden. And it was the most charming food, and the landscape is just gorgeous. And this is coming into the, to the, 
to the, the museum. And the last one, I think, is the interior. And there's me sitting all scrunched up. And this is a sort of a, a, a bit this of... This is a reproduction of their sitting uh, room. It is a reproduction of their sitting room. And here are all the little pieces of sculpture, which, of course, are Matisse's sculpture, mm -hmm. all round as well. What we realised is that it very much looks like Pat sitting room. <laughs> <laughs> did a bit. Weirdly did, enough. Did a bit. Weirdly enough. But really, I can't tell you how gorgeous it was. I mean, the, the, we, we simply adored it. And what I wanted just briefly to tell you to write, to re read you, if I can get it and do it again, because it's so important. It's, it's, it's such a nice piece of, of writing about, about the, the ladies. It said, um, this is the, 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 writer, the writer speaking. I find the Cone sisters to be incredible, a, a, a model and inspiration for the future of Baltimore, says Cara Ober, the founding editor and publisher. These were collectors who invested for a lifetime in the artists they believed in, who weren't particularly famous at that time. As a result of their patronage and support, these artists became world-renowned figures that they are today. The Cone sisters were visionary risk-takers who invested in the artists they personally believed in. And, and this, is, this, is, this is absolutely wonderful. The, the, the collection they built together tells the story of two women who placed a tremendous value in promoting new ideas and celebrating revolutionary artists and forming an archive of a time period that we would come to know as one of the most exciting creative eras in the past centuries. And this was a two. And, but the final one, which is quite extraordinary, this is the, this is the nephew of... of, of um, I've got this written down somewhere. Sorry, there are all these my bits of paper. I should have done this much more seriously, but I must tell you this. Uh, uh, where are we? This is what the nephew, because it's an extraordinary situation. It's it's the man who was discussing the nephew. He said uh, he was he was writing the the uh, the Carabao Co Memorial. And and he it, he says Matisse also seemed to realize the potential of the collection as part of his legacy. He spoke to, spoke of the future of the Cone Museum, and said to have specifically advised Ella on Etta on pieces that would mesh well with each other in the works of her collection. When he visited Baltimore in 1930, Matisse personally cleaned up one of the paintings of the Marlboro with water and ivory soap. That visit would have been the first time in years he'd seen many of his works, including Clarabelle's Blue Nude. And when he came in 1930, he saw the Blue Nude. Um, and not long after, he started to work on another version of the reclining nude, the pig nude. And I think he wanted for these things to be seen altogether. And it really is quite marvelous, to, the, the, the personal connection. And, and then eventually something really quite marvelous happened because the, 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 the niece, the nephew of the Matisse, of, of, of Marguerite, actually met this particular uh, collector, the, 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 the writer here. And he said, on a trip to New York in 2010, Colwell and now retired a, 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 a curator of the of the Cone collection uh, uh, visited the trainee's wife Barbara. At one point, Claude left the room and returned with a stack of matted prints. He came back with an armful, said Colwell, and he said, "These are very special. Each of these prints is inscribed by Matisse to my mother." Uh, he said. With these, we'd like to establish the Marguerite Dutroy collection at the Baltimore Museum of Art because my mother, her best friend, was Etta Cohn, and I think my mother would be pleased to know of all these things going to the museum. And he, he left with 250 Matisse drawings. Isn't that lovely? Wow. Marvellous. 